Greetings, Yale Divinity School worshiping community. No matter where or how we do it, it's good to be together. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share some thoughts on this anniversary of a day the world tilted off its axis, especially during a time when it's tilted and askew yet again. These are days when it's important to remember that we have been through hard times as a human family before. And if we pay attention, we might find we have some learning from then that can be of use to us now. A typical question you might hear today is, where were you on 9-11? When the planes hit the towers, the Pentagon, and the dirt in a Pennsylvania field, some of you were too young to know what was going on. Others of you were right where you are now, serving at YDS, and can tell stories of how this community responded. Today, instead of focusing on what you and I were doing on 9-11, I want to remember what was going on that day for our mothers. If you were so fortunate as to have had your mother in your life then, I encourage you to take a moment to picture where she was and what she was doing and how she got through 9-11. I'll go first. My mother, Jackie, was in 2001, a newly minted technology entrepreneur. She had gone back to work after retirement helping a tech startup launch a healthcare product that used this new tool called the internet to discharge patients from hospitals. On 9-11, my mother was in Chicago, meeting with IT designers in what was then called the Sears Tower. Mid-meeting, those gathered got word that they needed to evacuate the Sears Tower was considered a potential target for attack. Thousands of people from the tower and all its neighboring buildings spilled out onto the streets. They were panicking, fumbling with their cell phones, trying to figure out what was happening and whether danger was headed their way. My mother kept her phone in her purse. She saw a cab stuck in the throng and got in it. She asked the driver to take her to Milwaukee, two hours away, where I had just started a new job as minister to the University of Wisconsin campus there. Mom called me from the cab. She was traveling so much in those days that I didn't even know she was in Chicago. My first thought was, thank God she's coming. My spouse, Dan, and I were both so upset. We'd moved to Milwaukee from Boston just the year before, and the Boston origin of the planes turned weapons made the events of the day feel close and all the more frightening. My second thought in those days before cabs took credit cards was, how much cash does my mother carry? My mother is a resilient person, descended from resilient people. Her clear head in the midst of chaos partly originated from her life in nursing, where keeping her head about her was part of the job. Yet the sheer unforeseeability of her situation that day in Chicago tells me her resilience runs even deeper than lived experience. She comes from a Maronite Christian family that fled Lebanon during a famine following the First World War. Scientists, specifically epigeneticists, tell us that experience, particularly trauma, changes our DNA in ways we can pass along to our offspring. From that point of view, one might say that strategic fleeing was programmed into my mother's DNA. The amount of cash she had on her person I still don't know how much or where she kept it, was a tactic my mother might have learned as a small child during the Second World War, 
she keeps a wartime food ration book in her cedar chest. Or maybe she learned that habit from her father, Smokey Joe Joseph, pillar of the shadow economy community of Niagara Falls, New York. The first thing I learned as a kindergartner about my Jiddu, who died before I was born, was that mob boss Joe Bananas attended his funeral. Or maybe her shrewdness goes back even further, inherited from my mother's ancestors, who ascended Mount Marin at the advent of the Ottoman Empire and stayed there for 500 years forming its brand of Christianity in isolation, where the mass is still said in Aramaic, and where a unique communal structure and culture emerged and matured. When your DNA was programmed from a mountain exile, chances are you're not going to trust an ATM card to get you out of a tight spot. My mother stayed with us in Milwaukee for 10 days as it took that long before airlines were operating and could bring her home to Connecticut. Had she hesitated in Chicago, she would have been stuck there in an anonymous hotel, unable to give and receive comfort to and from her loved ones. I'd like to think I've inherited some of my mother's resilience as she raised me and her ancestors are now mine. Although I admit, I rarely have more than a couple of ones in my wallet, a habit that drives my mother crazy. I take as the key passage for my message today, the first part of the fourth verse of the 145th Psalm, which Marta chanted so beautifully for us. One generation shall laud your work to another. We know little about this or any other psalm's historical context. Compilers classified Psalm 145 as a song of praise. It's one of 10 written in acrostic form, with each line beginning with a different letter in Hebrew, running all the way through the alphabet in order. The style rings today of birthday cards and tributes at going away parties. But make no mistake, this psalm isn't frothy with sentimentality, but tightly constructed, sincere, and beautiful. The psalms are best understood as a hymnal, a collection of songs from different times and situations that are meaningful most of all because they've been sung by so many for such a long time. This line in Psalm 145, one generation shall laud your work to another, presents to us a double loop. We look back to the Psalms of dozens of generations ago. The Psalmist is doing the same thing, looking back even further. The Psalmist knows that we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and teaches us to do the same. Those who came before passed the good news of God's strength and goodness to us so we could learn to trust God in the face of whatever this era throws our way. Therefore, who are we now to lose hope? Well, we're human beings, and losing hope from time to time is either one of our glitches or one of our features. The question is not whether we'll feel emptiness in our lives. It's where we'll find the resources we need for replenishment. Humanity has survived hard times before. Civilizations have suffered and overcome race-based hatred and violence. Pandemics have come and gone. Economies have teetered in ways where the rich were safe and the poor were imperiled. Our mother earth has struck back against those who sought to dominate her rather than care for her. We've had plenty of amoral leaders out for their own advantage, including the king who wrote a fair number of our Psalms. These times are as hard as I can remember, but my memory isn't just my memory. Programmed into me, are the memories of generations that have come through 
on the other side. These are not days when self-reliance will help us enough. We have to turn to our predecessors and our ancestors. None of the crises shaking the globe are entirely unprecedented, but there is something new and overwhelming in their concurrence. No more saving for a rainy day the treasure trove of resources we can, we can find in accrued wisdom. It's raining. None of us has prior lived experience to bring to the situation in which we find ourselves. So we look around at how we can rely on one another, look back to our predecessors and how they survived, and we look inside. For God is in us. God is all around us. God came before us, and after we die, God will still be with us in ways we can't, in this life, know. And yet, even with God's outlandish imminence, we are not God. So, we sing God's praise and invest in God and only God, our trust. My prayer for these difficult times is that together we're creating a new strain of resilience, building it into our DNA so we can pass it on to the next generation. May it be so. Amen.